Hi everyone, this is the first of two lectures for week 13. We are getting toward the end of the semester, so we're going to start our diversification of life unit. These would have been played before your individual presentations. Um, so we'll, we'll cover um, in three lectures, two this week and one next, all of the tree of life as we know it. Uh, we could have individual courses on each one of these groups, so it's a very very small overview of the tree of life. Um, so that's this week, next week. And then we have one more week after that of instruction. We'll talk about ecology and maybe another topic. So just so, you know, so that you know what we're, what we're looking ahead toward, we have two lectures this week, one next, um, and that will be our diversification of life unit. So I'll get to my PowerPoint here, and we'll get started on viruses, archaea, and bacteria. So this might be a little bit of a, of a review for those who had these groups for your presentations, um, but maybe you can use this then as a, as a starting point for your second presentation. All right, I love these groups. So I'm excited to talk about them. So our agenda is pretty simple. We're going to talk about viruses for about half of the presentation and then jump into archaea and bacteria. Okay, so what the heck are these groups? Well, first we'll go over our goals. Um, so I hope by the end of this lecture that you will be able to distinguish what a virus, a bacteria, and an archaeon is, what these groups are, um, some, some different characteristics. Uh, we'll also dig into vaccines, why they're important for combating viral infections, and just as a, a goal for all of these diversification lectures, just start to, starting to appreciate the vast, the vast diversity of organisms there are. Um, so we might not hear a lot about vaccines or viruses or bacteria kind of outside of um, the context of infections for humans, but there's thousands and thousands and thousands of different kinds um, that, that don't impact us very much. Okay, so those are the goals for today. Now we're getting into these different groups. So this, what, this is a figure from a, a new publication. So don't worry about all these names. Grab my laser here. Um, so we're, I'm just going to walk through this briefly. We'll, re we'll revisit this again in our lecture on eukaryotes. So that's kind of this group here. Um, and then archaea are a really cool group of organisms. They're also microscopic like bacteria, but have very different um, characteristics on the molecular level. So they're a distinct group of life. So we have bacteria on one branch of our tree. Uh, we have things with a nucleus on another lineage, and then those, those cool groups of archaea right here. And so I hope one thing you got of that fossil and phylogenies lecture was that every time you look at a phylogenetic tree, you're looking at a hypothesis. Um, so we, we generate trees based on lots of different kinds of data. So our, our result is just the, the best explanation for what we give um, that tree. So they'll change depending on what techniques and what data you put into them. So your textbook has one way of organizing the tree of life, uh, but this is a little bit different because there's kind of two different ideas. So I think this A, three domains hypothesis fits um, the one in your textbook really well. But there's also this other idea of how things are related and that's called the archaeal host hypothesis. So for now, um, just because keeping this in the back of your mind as an overview for these different groups, um, just know we're, we're talking about bacteria today, we're talking about archaea today, and we're also talking about viruses. Um, but those aren't on this tree of life. So we're going to discuss why that is. So when we look at all the different organisms we can put on a tree, um, we can't put viruses on there because they don't have the same components that things with cells do. Um, so a lot of the data that goes into making these big trees of life look at the genes that make up our ribosomes. Those are the little machines where um, protein synthesis happens, and viruses don't have those. Um, so we, we can't really include those on the tree. When we think back all the way back to the beginning of the semester, for our definition of life, um, viruses don't necessarily fit that definition. 
So some scientists say viruses aren't alive. Some people kind of stretch the definition of life a little bit. Um, it's, it's not a cut and dry um, characterization, let's say. Um, so viruses have been in the news a lot lately. I don't talk about the one that causes COVID-19 specifically, but if you want more information, I'm happy to, to share some links if you're interested. Otherwise, for the rest of the lecture, just know that we're not going to talk about that one. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in how we classify viruses and how many different kinds there are, this New York Times article um, is a really good one if you want to look into more details. So in any case, viruses are not on our tree of life, so what are they? They're very, very, very small, so very microscopic, obligate parasites. And so that means that viruses can't reproduce by themselves. They need to be able to infect a host to get their genetic information into a cell. They use the cell's own machinery to pump out more viruses. Um, so there's a really excellent book by Carl Zimmer called A Planet of Viruses. Um, very short, less than 200 pages. Um, very interesting read if you're looking for, for more reading material. Um, so essentially, they're made of genetic material and proteins. Those are the, the big components. So look at a couple of different ways that viruses are put together. Tons of different variety, lots of different types of shapes, um, all stemming from a piece of information. So they have their own genomes that are inside here. And then the outer, we call it a capsid, basically a protein coat that surrounds these. So some viruses have a lipid component. That's why it's really good to wash your hands, because when you're washing your hands, you're basically just breaking open those viruses and conquering, defeating them. So wash your hands. Um, but essentially, the simplest way of describing what a virus is is a, a piece of bad news wrapped in a protein. OK, so we mentioned that they need to get their genetic material into a host where they can make more viruses. So this is how they do that. So this uh, example is a cool alien looking like structure called a bacteriophage. So these are viruses that specifically infect bacteria. So they're going to um, be floating around. When they encounter a bacteria, they'll latch on to the surface. Then they're able to inject their genetic material, their genome. This DNA or RNA then um, is made into the pieces that make up a protein, that make up a virus. So then within these cells, they're pumping out these pieces of virus. And after the cell fills up with all these, um, it's, going to, it's going to burst open and release all these viruses. So this is what happens um, when cells become infected. So this is what causes a lot of different diseases are the effects of different cells breaking open. OK, so now it's made a bunch of new viruses, and they can go along and find new bacteria or other hosts in order to replicate. OK, so hopefully this isn't too choppy when you're watching this video. If you want more of a smooth playback, Check out the slides on Moodle. But as we're watching this video, we're seeing from the very smallest, like cold viruses, going up to this bacteriophage. And now we're in the realm of, of living things. So bacteria tend to be about um, 100 times bigger than viruses. And our own red blood cells are even bigger still. So just so you can kind of get a sense of the scale that we're talking about. Viruses are very, very small compared to everything else. That's because they need to, to fit inside of other cells to reproduce. So our neurons, thousands of times bigger than a virus, um, moving up to things like diatoms, which we'll talk about in our next lecture on protists, paramecium, amoebas, a small microscopic animal called a water bear or a tardigrade, all the way up to a frog egg. So again, if you want a smooth playback experience, check out the slide in Moodle and put it in presentation mode. Uh, but now, hopefully, you have a little bit of better sense of the scale, what a virus looks like compared to a bacterium, compared to our own cells. Okay, moving on to the next. 
slide. Um, they are harmful if there are viruses that infect humans. Um, and there are lots of things um, that can jump from different species. So I think it's important to take a step back and recognize that viruses have been on this planet for a really, really long time. Um, and the, the vast majority are not going to cause human infections. In fact, viruses have a really important role to play in the environment um, and in ecology as a whole. This is just to, to kind of take a step back to think about that. Uh, and something that I learned really recently that blew my mind was that some viruses have their own viruses. So uh, in the last couple of years, scientists have discovered these giant viruses that are as big as some uh, bacteria, which is just insane. So if you want to see a video explanation of viruses that infect other viruses, uh, check out that link. Essentially, there's a virus in a bigger cell, and then these tiny, tiny viruses infect the bigger virus. Um, but in any case, viruses are found in every ecosystem on Earth. And the image on the right just kind of shows an example of how viruses can influence or impact or contribute to the ecology um, of an environment. So some viruses might be able to infect a single species. This would change the host behavior so if they get really sick. Um, they might not be able to do so much. Um, some viruses infect multiple species, uh, but only really impact one. Um, you'll see an example of that in your lab activity this week. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea of the scale. So it can be an individual or a population level. It might influence how many offspring there are in a specific species. Um, and depending on what kind of organism a virus infects, then that might influence predator-prey interactions. Right? So if a predator gets really sick from a virus, then the prey populations can increase. Um, or if the prey drops off, that influences the population size of the predators if there's not as much food around. So just kind of thinking about what the, the contributions of viruses are in the environment. Okay, so but now moving back to that context of infections. So how do we treat a virus? Well, we need specific kinds of, of medicine or compounds that defeat viruses. Um, because they take advantage of our host machinery, it's hard to, to isolate the virus to get rid of it. Um, so we have some antiviral drugs. But the very, very best way of getting rid of viruses is by getting a vaccine. So prevention is much better than trying to deal with an infection you already have. And vaccines are able to prevent you from getting sick. Um, I'll revisit it when we talk about bacteria, but there's a difference between vaccines and antibiotics. So antibiotics will not treat viruses, um, and we'll see why that is later. So the best way of preventing viral infections is with a vaccine. And the way they work, um, there's lots of different kinds of vaccines, but they're all essentially training our immune system to recognize a virus before we become sickened by one. So there's live viruses, there's um, killed viruses. So sometimes you can take pieces of a virus um, and inject it so your body recognizes it in case you actually do become infected. Um, there's lots of different ways of making them. But all of them uh, teach our immune system how to respond. OK, so you'll see um, a little bit more of this process of, our, of what antibodies are, what our immune system does in, in your lab activity. So vaccines are really important. Um, we've been able to tamp down or even conquer viruses like smallpox is completely eradicated from the globe thanks to uh, worldwide efforts to combat it because we have a vaccine for it. Um, current efforts now to try to get rid of polio from the whole globe are ongoing. Um, but with the, the boon that vaccines give us, almost since the very beginning of humans using vaccines, there has been a backlash. Um, so the anti-vax movement actually has a very long history. 
to see an overview of that, go ahead and go to this link right here. Um, but in, in recent years, there's been a, a specific surge of anti-vaccine sentiment um, for, for a couple different reasons, uh, stemming from kind of distrust of the medical community and a lot of other factors. But regardless of the reason why people are nervous about vaccines, if you choose to not vaccinate yourself or your children, you're not just um, making them more exposed to viral infections that could be really devastating, but you're also impacting the people around you, the population as a whole. So this image is a, a satirical cartoon. Um, this scary preventable disease could be measles, could be polio, could be a lot of things that we have a vaccine for, is kept in check by, by many, many people becoming vaccinated. And so people that subscribe to these anti-vaccine views are slowly weakening everyone's ability to fight off these infections. So we'll, we'll look into this in the next slide or two. Uh, one of the biggest diseases that are having a big resurgence is measles. Um, it might not sound very familiar, which is good. Um, if you haven't heard about this disease or experienced it, it's actually um, pretty terrible. And measles, the virus is extremely infectious. So with a common cold, um, if you are sick and you're out and about, um, you might get one or two other people sick. If you have measles, you could get up to um, and possibly more than 13 plus people sick. So it's extremely, extremely infectious. Um, it was eradicated from the US completely in 2000, the year 2000, um, but since then, with more and more people not becoming vaccinated, it's actually coming back in a lot of places, which is worrying for the healthcare profession. So get vaccinated. Um, we'll see why that's important, not just for yourself, but for um, our group as a whole. So not everyone actually can get every vaccine that's available. Um, some people with certain um, diseases, like cancer or other immune kind of weakening diseases aren't able to necessarily um, deal with a vaccine. So if you're immunocompromised, you're relying on everyone around you to become vaccinated. So really, really young children, um, people with these certain diseases um, are very vulnerable to these kinds of infections. So herd immunity is this idea that if enough people become vaccinated, you're able to prevent this disease from spreading far, if at all. And so people that study these things have metrics for being able to figure out how many people need to be vaccinated for this herd immunity. But if enough people are immunized and they stay healthy and they don't become infected, it really decreases the risk of any one person being able to infect someone else. So herd immunity is this idea for why everyone should get a flu shot or any other vaccine that prevents these diseases from infecting vulnerable people. And you'll study specifically, kind of learn more about the scientists that, that study these called epidemiologists in your lab, which is a fun one this week. So that was viruses in a nutshell. If you take anything away from that virus section, um, make sure you get your vaccines and you're up to date with those including getting a flu shot every year. Small, little, obligate parasites um, that are pretty cool, I think, overall. But now we're getting into what's officially considered life. So with this lecture, the one that you'll watch next, and the one next week, we're going to look at the, whole, the tree of life as a whole. So everything from meat, microscopic organisms that live in the pools of Yellowstone, all the way up through um, multicellular animals, plants, fungi, etc. And so here's just to revisit that figure from the beginning. We're going to chat about bacteria, and we're going to chat about archaea. Okay, so what are bacteria? 
Um, unicellular organisms, they come in many, many different shapes and sizes. They have um, a genome, but they don't have a nucleus like eukaryotes do. They don't have any kind of membrane-bound organelle. So all of those things we learned about at the beginning of the semester, nucleus, Golgi, ER, chloroplasts, bacteria don't have any of those components. No nucleus, no organelles, um, but they're still able to undergo pretty complex things. Um, they're really amazing organisms. And we'll dig into some examples here. So when we look back at the fossil record, um, people that are trained to observe these things have found evidence of bacteria all the way uh, about three and a half billion years ago. So if we look in the fossil record, we look at those different layers, we can calculate that um, these organisms that were living about three and a half billion years ago, um, that was the first time bacteria showed up. So they've been around and on this planet for a very long time. So they've had billions of years of evolution um, to come up with how they look like today. So not only um, do they carry out a lot of different functions, but historically, they changed Earth's atmosphere as a whole. So when we thought about photosynthesis, I probably briefly mentioned, um, but there was a point in Earth's history where all of a sudden there was tons of oxygen in the environment. So if we think all the way back to our fireball Earth, right, hot, horrible, not very conducive for life. Um, after that time where bacteria emerged, there was a, a quite a while where they were able to live with those conditions. Um, but then something called cyanobacteria came along. Um, some people call this blue-green algae, but it's a type of bacteria. And this is able to photosynthesize. Right? So it's able to use energy from sunlight to generate oxygen. Um, and so these cyanobacteria were able to grow and multiply. And as a whole, over millions of years, completely changed the atmosphere of Earth. So now we have tons of oxygen in the atmosphere, and this allowed a whole new set of organisms to evolve. So if we think back to our um, lecture on mass extinctions, with this really drastic change in the environment, um, a lot of organisms probably didn't survive, but it opened new opportunities for, for new organisms to evolve. So bacteria might be small, but they're pretty mighty as a whole. OK, so thinking about what bacteria contribute um, to the environment, they do lots and lots of things. So again, with viruses, most of them don't impact humans, um, for the directly at least. The majority of bacteria are actually doing really important things in the environment. So a very, 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 very small percentage of all the bacteria on Earth are going to make us sick. So what else are they doing? Um, you actually have lots and lots of bacteria on and in your body. And different kind of areas are different habitats for these bacteria. But one of the big advantages of having these bacteria, um, when they live in your gut, they're able to help you break down certain foods and make certain vitamins and minerals available, different nutrients. So they're able to actually help you digest food. Um, if you think of, of cows and other livestock that eat grass and other things, they have tons of really cool bacteria and archaea even that help them break down those plants to get energy. They also help decompose things. So not just helping you digest food, um, but things that are, are outside that need to be broken down. Bacteria are really good at doing that. So they're able to recycle nutrients for the environment as a whole. Um, another really delicious example of why bacteria are helpful um, with any kind of fermented food. So if you think all the way back to the years before we had refrigerators, um, people had different ways of storing food. So you could salt things to preserve them. Um, you could also ferment things. If you had kimchi um, or salami or cheese or yogurt, um, those are food products that were fermented. And that's all thanks to bacteria. 
um, and fungi, which I'll revisit during that lecture. But bacteria help preserve food and make food. So buttermilk, yogurt, cheese, um, anything fermented, you can think bacteria. Um, if you know people or have seen people start with sourdough starters or if you've eaten sourdough bread before, um, that's all thanks to bacteria. Yummy. Okay. And then one other example, um, thanks to our amoeba sisters, is they're able to fix nitrogen for plants. Well, what does that mean? Um, so if you're a plant growing in the soil, you need certain nutrients like nitrogen. Um, it's not in a form that you can necessarily use, though. So there are bacteria that will live in the roots of a lot of plants that will convert the unhelpful form of nitrogen into a useful one that the plant can use. So kind of like um, the ones living in our guts that help us get nutrients, there are some in the roots of plants that do the same thing. Um, and beyond those examples, one of my favorites, uh, lots of bacteria have really specialized relationships with other plants, animals, fungi, other things. Um, and if you've never seen the Hawaiian bobtail squid, these are super cute little squids that fit in the palm of your hand. They live in really shallow waters in Hawaii. And they have a really remarkable ability to kind of glow in the dark. And they're able to do that because this really special bacteria called Vibrio fisheri can bioluminesce. So this is just some bacteria that are growing in this flask that can glow in the dark. And so these bacteria live in specialized places in the squid. Um, so at night, it can hide from the things it's trying to eat. And things that want to eat it don't necessarily see it as well. Um, so bacteria have very specialized relationships with different organisms. Um, they're really amazing little dudes. OK, so important for lots of reasons. And then coming back to us, um, some very, med very um, important medical things. So again, a very, very, very small percentage of bacteria actually make us sick. Um, there are tons of different species that are helpful that are living on our skin, in our gut, just everywhere there could be bacteria. However, there are some that do make us sick. Um, and the way we can combat those infections is with antibiotics. And again, just so that everyone's clear about this, if you're sick with what might be a cold and you're not sure if it's a bacterial cold or something caused by a virus, um, it's really important that you only take antibiotics if it's a bacterial infection. We'll talk about why that is in a minute. Um, but antibiotics are very helpful drugs that can um, kill the bacteria or at least prevent them from growing any farther so that we don't become really sick because of these bacteria. So bacteria are different enough from our cells. They have some similar components. So they have ribosomes, but they're a little bit different flavor. Um, so a lot of these drugs will target aspects of what a bacteria needs to survive that aren't in common with human cells. So that way, we're only killing bacteria and not doing damage to our own cells. Um, so if we're thinking about right, ribosomes, they need to make proteins to grow and survive. If we can stop um, them being able to create proteins, they can't survive, so they can't grow more uh, and lead to a more serious illness. OK, so why is it important to only take antibiotics when you need them? Well, the first antibiotics were developed um, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, probably even later. Don't quote me on that. Anyway, um, so they haven't been around for very long in terms of our relationship with bacteria. And so because bacteria have very short generation times, um, there's tons of them in the environment, they're able to evolve uh, resistance a lot faster than we're able to keep up with being able to kill them. So if you remember that table with those really cool bacteria, they were able to grow into those areas with very, very, very high doses of antibiotics in only 11 days. And so it was growing in an environment that was really nice. Um, our bodies are much less 
um, amenable to them staying, so it takes longer than 11 days to form resistance. But once there are bacteria that are out there that our antibiotics won't work on, um, they're very hard then to treat. So there's lots of examples of diseases now um, that are resistant to the antibiotics we have. And so there's lots of different reasons for why they can develop resistance. But one possibility is that if you're sick with an infection and you take an antibiotic, you're supposed to take it for two weeks, as an example. If you start to feel better at about seven, 10 days, and you decide, oh, I feel fine, I don't need to complete that course, well, you might not have killed all of the bacteria. There might be some then that are able to grow that are resistant to that, to that, to that drug. Um, so it's important not to use them when we don't need to so that we limit the amount of bacteria that can evolve resistance. But there's also uses for antibiotics that don't relate to human health. So in agriculture, antibiotics are used quite a bit. Um, and if they're not used in a responsible way, it can lead to um, pretty bad antibiotic resistance. And so if you need another thing to read, um, either this summer or the rest of the semester, I can highly recommend something called Big Chicken by Marin McKenna that goes into the history of antibiotic um, use, specifically how it relates to uh, raising chickens. Fascinating book. Um, but in any case, it's, it's becoming more and more of a problem not being able to treat certain types of bacteria with antibiotics. Okay. So that was bacteria. We've been able to study them for a very, very long time. We know a lot more about them. Um, archaea are a distinct group of life, but we didn't know they existed until about the 1970s. And the only way we know that they're a distinct group of life is based on their genetic sequences. So under the microscope, they might look kind of similar, but they're very, very different. So they're also prokaryotes. They're also things that don't have a nucleus or other organelles. And in fact, when you look at who's related to who, humans and other things with a nucleus are closely related to archaea more closely related to archaea than to bacteria. So archaea are our very, very, very distant cousins compared to bacteria. So you find archaea in really extreme places. So places without oxygen at all, like the deep sea floor, in really hot thermal pools, like at Yellowstone National Park. That's another reason why we didn't know they existed until recently, was because they're really hard to, to find and identify. Um, but they, they live in super extreme environments, cold, hot, no oxygen, um, very salty environments. So they have really unique adaptations that help them live in these places. Because we haven't known about them for as long as these other groups, we don't know if they cause any human disease. Um, but we do know of some examples where they're actually helping. Um, so some of them help us digest certain complex sugars that our body otherwise wouldn't be able to break down. Um, and if you're thinking about your, your beauty routine, you can thank Archaea for helping to maintain healthy skin. Here's just some really neat images of these organisms. So again, different shapes and sizes. So thinking about bacteria and Archaea, um, instead of the complex process of meiosis and sexual mating, some bacteria in archaea can just split in half. So that's called fission. They can reproduce asexually. They can divide, grow bigger after eating, um, grow larger again, and then they'll receive signals that tell it to divide. And then thinking about bacteria and archaea and what they're able to do on the molecular level, um, there's a huge amount of diversity in what they can do with their metabolism. So in the different sources of energy they can use and what compounds they're able to make. So you can see in your book um, in Table 29.3 kind of different methods for how 
bacteria and archaea can use and produce energy. Um, but these ideas are very important. These abilities are really important for fermentation. Like we talked about making our delicious yogurt, um, a lot of bacteria can photosynthesize. A lot of them undergo cellular respiration. Um, because they've had so much time to evolve, they can do really amazing things. Some of them can even consume oil. So some researchers are looking at this ability to try to combat oil spills and things like that. Scientists are also looking at organisms that can digest plastic. Um, and bacteria or archaea are really good candidates for looking at things that can degrade these polymers. Okay, so very diverse metabolisms. They can reproduce asexually. They're very small. They don't have a nucleus.